Hey, first readers. Your hosts are taking a few weeks off this summer to work on other projects, so we're bringing you a series from the First Reading Vault, our walk through the Genesis lectionary texts from back in 2020. There are a few pandemic references in here because, well, that's what was happening in 2020, but there are also some real gems in here to help with your preaching this time through Year A in the RCL. So enjoy the episode, and we'll see you again with new content later in the summer. Hi friends, welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament lectionary podcast for preachers, teachers, and Jerry. I'm Tim McNinch. I'm Rachel Wren. Who's Jerry? I don't know. I just wanted Jerry's to know that they're included here too. Uh, they are typically a minority oppressed group, aren't they? I right, see, right. I see. Well, anyway, friends and Jerry, today we are covering Genesis 45, verses 1 to 15, the first reading for August 16th, 2020. And Tim, you've got some tips for us, I believe? Yeah, yeah. So this is part of a conclusion to the Joseph story that you introduced us to last week. In fact, this is the the sort of climactic moment of the story where Joseph, who is now basically vice pharaoh in Egypt, reveals his identity to his brothers who have come to Egypt looking for food to survive the famine. Oh, it's such a great moment, isn't it? I mean, it is just like the height of drama and high stakes at at this time. Definitely. In fact, this makes such a good story that it can be kind of hard to preach without kind of killing the drama of the story. Uh, Mm. And perhaps I could frame that as, as our first sort of preaching pitfall. Preaching this moment in the story in isolation is kind of like telling the punchline of a joke without any of the setup. <laughs> the The lectionary gives us the beginning of the story last week in the passage that we talked about with Joseph's brother selling him away. But if you as a preacher jump straight from there to here without any of the stuff in the middle, it can be way confusing. Like, wait a second, Joseph was sold into slavery and now he's in charge of all Egypt? That's absolutely true. Uh, And it it feels very relevant to my life because my kids are at the age right now where they love knock-knock jokes. So Uh we tell lots of knock-knock jokes. So it'd be like saying, knock-knock. Who's there? Aren't you glad I didn't say banana? Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So how can preachers deal with this giant gap? Well, you could always toss out the lectionary and just preach this Joseph story, this Joseph novella as kind of a longer series of its own. And I think there would be a lot of good mm. that could come from that. Yeah. Or if you want to do last week's text and then this week's text, I would really recommend devoting a little more time to selecting some helpful excerpts from the story to read in addition to this climactic moment. Mm. Mm-hmm. One of the plot points to definitely make note of is that this isn't the first time that Joseph and his brothers see each other again. By this point, those brothers have been back and forth a number of times, and Joseph, who is still unrecognized by his brothers, he's he's kind of put them through an emotional ringer, Mm -hmm. pretending to think that they're spies and thieves. He's made them fear for their lives and fear for the life of their elderly father, Jacob, back in Canaan. And those details of the story make a big difference in how we interpret what happens right here in this section. Well, and I think you pulled out such nice, quick ones that wouldn't be hard to include in a sermon. I think that giving that sort of context could be done pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so with all that in mind, what do you see going on in this section that we do have from the lectionary? Yeah, well, perhaps the, the key content, the key moment here is the idea summarized in verses seven and eight. Joseph says, God sent me here to Egypt before you in order to preserve a remnant. So it wasn't really you who sent me here, but God. Hmm. Now, I want to highlight there another potential preaching pitfall. It's tempting to preach this as, see, everything that happens, even the terrible things, are actually part of God's plan. Yeah, I've heard that one before. Yeah, and in a way, this text does say something like that. Mm -hmm. But you probably don't need me to tell you that when you preach that kind of doctrine of divine providence, you run the real risk of minimizing people's actual suffering and trauma Mm -hmm. and, in effect, asking them to get over it because it's actually part of God's grand plan. That's a great point. Now, um, this here might be a little too anchored in our fleeting news cycle by the time that this goes to post. 
But we're <laughs> recording this just a couple days after a prominent and notably white megachurch pastor tried to make that same sort of uh, theological jump about slavery. Mm-hmm. He said it was awful, of course, uh, but that God still used slavery to set up a society with lots of blessing and prosperity for white people. Oh, so gosh. instead of saying that slavery manifested white privilege, he proposed that we call it white blessing. Oh, I just threw up in my mouth a little. <laughs> now, there's all sorts of problems with what that guy said. But part of the reason that a nice white guy and veteran pastor could say something so torturously racist is because he was trying to ram the square peg of the evil of slavery into the round hole of this doctrine of God's providence. And that doesn't work, and it's dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think that's a really helpful because it can feel so easy to say, and a lot of our parishioners can say it, um, at least it's something I heard a lot, but when you stretch it out like that, you can really see how dangerous of an idea it actually is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Okay, so what do you do about it in this text? Because the text really seems to be saying exactly that, doesn't it? That's that's true. And I also want to say that for all of that, I, I actually do believe in God's providence over what happens mm. in the world. But it's a doctrine that requires some nuance. Mm. And I think this text actually gives us some of that nuance. For example, Even though Joseph does credit God with using his brother's treachery to save Egypt and by extension to save Jacob's whole clan, he still names their sin in verse 4, saying, you sold me here. Mm. There's some truth in this truth and reconciliation moment. In addition, uh, Joseph doesn't forgive immediately, but only after in the previous chapter, Judah offers to rescue Benjamin by taking his place as a slave in Egypt. So Joseph has looked for some growth in character among his brothers before offering them reconciliation. And that's so beautiful, too, because it was Judah's idea to sell him in the first place. Exactly. And there's even a kind of, a sort of kind of reparation required in that the brothers, the ones who sold Joseph away out of jealousy for their father's love, are tasked by Joseph with reporting all of his successes to their father. Mm. (laughs) <laughs> see, see verse 13 there. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So bottom line, even though Joseph frames all of this as God's doing, human agency and responsibility isn't erased. Joseph's forgiveness of his brothers is a gift of grace when he would have been within his rights to seek revenge. But Joseph chooses grace because Not because he sees that this was God's plan all along, so to speak, but that he sees that God has used even his brother's treachery to overcome a devastating evil. I think that's so important and so well said, Tim, because one of the the most dangerous aspects of the doctrine of forgiveness is it can lead people to think that they need to give up part of their wholeness as a human being, that they need to sacrifice their ability to, to really demand being treated as a whole human being and instead they should just forgive over and over again and what you just said holds both of those intention i think that was really well done yeah i think you need to hold those things together and i think that's that sort of uh, approach is the way to preach this kind of doctrine of divine providence from a text like this Mm. i i think it's right to affirm that god is still in control of things Chaos and evil are not going to win in the end. But those forces aren't like part of God's design. Rather, they're factors that God overcomes and sometimes even commandeers to bring liberation. Nice. God can even turn our own pain towards good for us, often by using that pain as a way to help us connect with and help others who are suffering. And it's important to reiterate, as the story does, that providence is a hindsight doctrine. What I mean by that is that you can only recognize God's providence in the face of unexpected good. Hmm. It's not a way to explain away present evil and pain and trauma. It's not a get over it and move on type of doctrine. And the reconciliation that happens in this passage comes with truth-telling and restorative justice. 
I think that's a fuller, thicker way to talk about the good that God brings about in this text and in our world. Preacher friends, I hope you take what Tim McNinch just did and take it almost verbatim and put it into a sermon because I think that is a sermon that so many Christians need to hear, that we need to hear as pastors, that our people need to hear, especially in this moment when chaos is raging around us. So amen, Tim, and preachers, take that and run with it. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end for the day. I feel inspired, and I hope you all do too. Tim, thanks for that great work. No problem. Friends, head over to the website, subscribe, share, preach, rejoice. Until next time, I'm Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McNinch. Thanks so much for listening.